Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and crap, how do I say your last name? I'm here with Jake. Meisner. Meisner. Yes, sir. It's Jake right. Meisner. <laughs> I just tell people call me Jake. Well, that so, works out well. That works well. Yeah. Um, we met yesterday at Free Training Day Midwest. Yes, sir. It was a good time. It was a good day. Exhausting, but good. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. You know, throw a, throw a cross-country flight on that. Right. <laughs> I bet. I imagine. Uh, but it was, it was a good time. And, and, you know, we got to work together a little bit. And, and I'm trying to think, is there anybody that I've sat down with that I met them the day before and we trained together a little bit and then we did this? And I don't think that's happened before. So that's kind of fun. All right. So I'm here we first. go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here we go. 900 something episodes. We're still finding firsts. We got to do that. And usually when I work with someone, I can figure out their background. I've got nothing. I have no idea what your background is. I could not tell from working with you. So you might find that complimentary or not. I mean it as a compliment, though. <laughs> Thank you. It's changed a little bit over the years. I, yeah. I started off in, uh, I mean, it's all mainly been Taekwondo related. I started off in a version that was kind of slightly removed from ITF. Still the same forms and, and, and all that, but they so we can get up and do some Chongji and some, right. some, some Dangan and, and exactly, exactly. All, right, all right, cool. Uh, and, but without the sine wave motion, my my oh. instructor was was not big on sine wave. Uh, occasionally we, I just say, affected some of my friends extra. out there. <laughs> not a fan. But uh, but yeah, a lot of the same styling and all that, and the sparring was similar to that, but a little bit more hardcore, hard contact. This was. Okay. Late eighties, early nineties when I got into it. So we were still fighting pretty rough back then. And I was yeah. twelve years old when I started, but I was pretty tall for twelve, so I was close to being in I was like the size to be in the teen and adult class. So I was getting thrown around by men that are my size now and sure. Which was fine, scary as heck, but fine because I got into it to deal with bullies and all that stuff. And if I could take a hit from a grown man kicking me back five yards and run back at him like, good one, hit me again, you know. Then yeah. a bully that was my size didn't really affect me anymore. It didn't phase me after a while. So uh, that was cool, but was I, it your idea to go in because of bullying or your parents? Mine. Yours. I needed something. You, I tried everything else. I had a mouth that was writing checks. My body couldn't <laughs> cash. Okay. I tried everything else. I tried to be funny, the funny guy, and and I'm I'm hilarious in in, in you know non planned context with my friends and family sure. and stuff like that, and, and and they think I'm funny. The bullies didn't like it, you know, when I'm talking back to them and it's back talk instead of, you know, just they, they don't, here's a funny joke. Bullies don't like when you're funnier and smarter than they are. <laughs> right. And more handsome. But, I, you know, that's that's for someone else to say. But uh, you do have the right style of haircut. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I moved. I, I dealt with bullies when I was young, real young in Oklahoma, where I, where I was started off living. And then somewhere in the middle of fourth grade. So it was like Christmas break. Mm -hmm. Moved to a, a new town in Texas, and Texas people are a little bit more cliquish than Oklahoma people. From what I found, that Oklahoma people are a little bit more accepting of everyone around them. And, well, and stuff from like what that. I understand, that the fact that you came from Oklahoma probably set you back a little bit. Probably, too. yeah. And so, you know, it wasn't it wasn't like we would go straight into school and meet all these people. We were on break for Christmas, and, and so the only kid I got to meet when I first moved to a new town was a kid who happened to live on my street, who was like the the dork of the school or something like that. You know, like if you remember Saved by the Bell, it was the screech kind of kid at yeah. the school. But he was nice to me and we had fun and, and, and all that. And we got along. So I show up to school and the bullies are picking on him. And I try to mouth off to him to, to save his butt. Mm. And now I'm their target yeah. for the next few years. And so getting into middle school, I tried, okay, well, what if I'm on their same team? What if I join the sports team with them and we're on the football team together, even though I was a scrawny kid. And then I just got, ended up, getting beaten up in the locker rooms. So at some point there in seventh grade, I'm like, I need some help because I can only ride my bike faster than five guys for so long. And then one of them is going to catch up to me or something right. like that, you know? And that's what it was like, honestly, leaving school and hauling butt home and trying to outride five guys, you know, trying to tackle me from behind. So at uh, some point, yeah, I found, I found a school that and, and this guy was just incredible. I mean, just fun to watch and charisma and all that stuff. And it's like, I want to be him, you know? So that got me into it, and it was it was a uh, taekwondo, like I said, slightly removed from ITF, but uh, more when I was leaving it in '96, when I was graduating high school and, and going off, moving off to college and all, they were getting really into the AAU Olympic sparring kind of stuff and all that, uh, and that's kind of what they look like now still. 
I'm not a big fan of the bouncing up and down with my hands down around my waist and all that stuff. So you're talking more of the World Taekwondo, WTF, right? Even though we've changed that name, right. style of sparring. Yeah, and it was fun for a while. I mean, the speed that it builds up when you're doing all, sure. a lot of tournament sparring and stuff like that was fun for me, and, and I was good at it. And I won my fair share of things, and that was fun. But then I got in, I moved around for college, ended up in Louisiana for grad school at LSU, and got in with a guy that at that point they were – International Taekwondo Alliance, the ITA, but now they're Tiger Rock and all that stuff. They mm. kind of split out again since then. And uh, the guy down there was a lot more, he was like 50-something years old and all. He's not like a physical specimen. You're going to be like, I want to look like that. But mm. uh, so nice, so welcoming, and everything he did was from more like a, a self-defense kind of perspective. Still Taekwondo, still the same forms, Chunji, Dangun, all those things and all that. Uh, the way they did it at that, at that point in time, but he's like, why are you pointing your toes and kicking up when you're doing front kicks? Who are you ever going to kick up like that? You know, you, you know, if you hit someone in the privates, there's a soft part, yes, but then after you get past that soft part, there's a bone that points down. So if you <laughs> hit with your flat foot like that, it's it's going to hurt. And I'm like, oh, never thought about that. Nobody mm -hmm. ever pointed that out. You know, I, I'd always had one of those hanging punching bags and all that, and I just slapped the bottom of that sucker yeah. left and right until my foot was red and all that, and I thought I was doing awesome, you know. And nobody ever said, how's that going to feel if you do that in a real fight? And I'm like, oh. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully you never find out. But, right. I mean, seems like a sensible point. Right. And so that, that was kind of interesting. So he helped me re rearrange my approach a little bit. And I mean, it's still, when I, when I first started with him, the first instructor I had was, we couldn't punch to the head. We could kick to the head and we could punch to the body and it was hard. So you didn't want to get hit no matter what. But I got really fast and really good at reflex mm. and, and ducking away from seeing feet coming at my head. I could, I could dodge those for the most part. But when you get to the, the ITA guys and they're punching in the head, this dodging doesn't work and they're just on Changes top of you. Yeah. So he helped me kind of break that down and, and I and, uh, with some drills that I've kind of since turned into some fun kind of game drills that I can teach the kids and go into public schools and have them do when I'm doing PE teacher for a day kind of stuff. You know, it's a lot of fun. Um, but it really helps them learn how to stand their ground and just, okay, you, you, don't, you don't need to panic when this gets here. Here's what your choices are. And, and I, I love that. So from that point on, I kind of developed and, and that's the reason I got into martial arts was for self-defense. You know, I knew I could get hit hard. I knew I could hit people back hard. I was busting boards left and right and had good speed, but I still in high school going through that, that first style of Taekwondo, I'd wake up in cold sweats at night, nightmares about bullies and, and bad guys or whatever. Did your parents stuff. know about that? I don't know if they knew about that part of it. I mean, I, it's a lot for a kid to shoulder. Yeah, <laughs> it really was. Wake it up in a cold sweat. That's, I mean, that's right. Nobody should have to have to right. live a life like that, let alone a teenager. Right. It was, yeah. You just kind of keep it to yourself and, and struggle on. I'd go out to the bag and punch the bag, kick the bag mm -hmm. a lot and all that until I just had no more worries. Honestly, that's how I used to just exhaust myself. Girlfriend's mad at me. We break up or something. I go out, punch the bag until I, I can't, can't walk or stand anymore and then go to bed and shower in the morning wait a minute I'm sweaty and all that stuff just it is hard to be stressed up. when you can't breathe exactly <laughs> exactly it really is that's one of the best uh, therapy therapies i've found so far is bag work so i i love that but uh since then since grad school then it, it kind of changed my focus and, and that's all i wanted to do is I, I love teaching people taekwondo i love the movement parts of it the forms breaking sp sparring for the most part uh when i find nice people to spar with <laughs> that don't want to kill me uh but teaching them from the perspective of here's why you would do this kick this way to get somebody off you, you know, or here's why this one is pretty in the air. Yes, but probably not as effective for self-defense. So we'll practice it, but I really want you to be good at this one and this one and this one, you know, and, and uh, you know, I want you to be able to move and throw all your spins and your jumps when we're sparring and you're demonstrating for testing and all that. But I also want to know if I get across from you for your black belt testing, because all my students have to fight me for their black belt. I, I want to know you can stop me, you know, just, I don't care if you're 10 years old and I'm coming at you or whatever. You need to throw something that's hard enough to kind of make me pause temporarily so I know this kid's got it, yeah. you know. So it's fun. When did you when did you start wanting to teach? I've been teaching since 14. I got my black belt, you know, got my black belt when I was 14. Okay. And right, the, the belt before then when you had to start you know, remembering all the forms and all yeah. that stuff, my instructor started pulling me in saying you need to start helping out. Was that classes. something you were enjoying? Loving it. Really? Loving it. I've why? always kind of wanted to be a teacher. I don't know why, but okay. that, 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 and, and that's music. a common answer when I, when I ask those sorts of questions, people just, you know, I teaching just felt right. Right. 
I love it. Yeah, it's just helping other people, you know, in a, in a way that I know I can do repeatedly. Mm-hmm. You try to do things like uh, uh, do, do donations and, and, and charity work and stuff like that, but that's not something I can have the resources to do every day, you know, and stuff like that. But I can give it myself all the time. You know, if I've got something and I've got some knowledge and you want to learn how to get there, I can do that. So it, it was kind of torn all through high school between that and, and music. I was I was a band student. I wanted to be a band director when I grew up and all that stuff. Or, or what instruments? Tuba mainly. Tuba. tuba. Uh, yeah. I think you're the first tuba. <laughs> but there's so and, and and I don't know how many episodes of the show you you've listened to, but longtime audience members know there are these two groups that keep showing up that I find fascinating. One is IT. Right. Computer nerds, right? Like that that was me. The other are musicians. Yeah, it's really it's really weird because because you'll see that in, in as as you get people that are black belts and they're teaching seminars. This guy is very analytical and very you know. So okay, I know what this guy. That's me. I, I got his background, you know. That's me. And then this guy's more artistic and more concept, and I'm like, okay, I bet that person's got some music or dance or something in their background and all yeah. that where they came from. And, and it's really it's not everybody, but it's. There, there seem to be more musicians in martial arts than in the broad population. And there are definitely more people coming out of IT in martial arts than the broad population. It really fascinates me. And I would think maybe both of those people, both of those types of people were people that, because both of their interests, those interests take up so much of your time, at least where I came from, like in, in Texas, you couldn't be on the football team and be in band. At the mm. same time, in some smaller schools, you probably can. You can be, you see cheerleaders strap on some drums and go out to the halftime show and, and play their things and all that stuff for marching band. But you, you kind of had to dedicate one or the other. Yeah. And and I I see it and it's it kind of correlates in my mind because it's a it's an individual thing. Yeah, martial arts an individual sport, music and all that's an individual. You can do it with groups and it's fun, but you don't have to. You can go solo and you can do duets. And, that's a great point. A lot more variety. And I think maybe the IT kind of same thing. It's 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 a solo endeavor for yeah. the most part. You're not trying to go You're up solving and team problems. Up with yeah. You're doing it on your own. It's a way you can serve and connect with other people. But at the end of the day, it's really it's it's on you in the same way martial arts is. So that's right. that's I, I like that. I like that. <laughs> All right. So graduate, you go to LSU, you're training in a different spot. And where where does life take you from there? <laughs> I graduated. I, I thought I was going to go into the military band. Uh, I, I won an audition for one that tours up and down the West Coast in, in, in California. But I uh, have a I'm deaf in one ear, had epilepsy when I was young, and they, the military doesn't like that. You can Some of the people I met in the band were, that I was auditioning for had half their intestines removed, but that happened after they got in the military, and that was okay. But me being a physical specimen of a martial artist and a, and a dancing, you know, because I was that summer that I auditioned, was happened to be a summer I was playing in Disneyland band in California. For, they're all all American college band kind of thing. We're dancing and, and all that, playing our instruments all around the park and stuff like that. I can do that, but not fit so enough to go it into the military. It didn't limit you, but <laughs> no, because you didn't check that box of I have two great ears. Right, that wasn't good. Right, so they. So what do you, what do you think about the? Uh, we'll use the word compromises. That are occurring with with entry standards in the military now to, to meet enrollment. <laughs> it's pissing me off. That I missed <laughs> yeah, the cutoff. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could you could show up now with you know twenty percent hearing, and they'd probably be pumped to have you. Right. Yeah, it's frustrating because you just in the music world that's 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 a really solid gig if you can mm-hmm. get something. I mean, even the bass bands are okay, but if you can get something that's a little bit more upper tiered and all that stuff, but the benefits of that come, that come with that and. You can have a secondary gig or whatever. You can teach music lessons on the side in addition to that job and all that, bring in some extra money and all that stuff. That kind of seems like a dream musical profession, right? Yeah. Like you're 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 in. You've got you've got this depth. You're doing some different cool stuff. Right. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> you're you're never gonna have to worry about the the parents at the at the school showing up on budget day saying, "Do we really need a music program?" Which right. Exactly. happens do, do, do our kids need art you know right you can just, that's you been can, a struggle you can play you can ju- just right you could just play so it, it'd be fun. it would have been fun yeah. but so i thought i thought i was gonna my two-year uh, master's program got kind of put into a, a three semesters so i was trying to graduate early just to see mm-hmm. if i could get into the the uh, basic training and all that stuff but then as that semester went on they, they said no you won't pass the physical part of it ah. okay so i graduated in december with no you know a, a 
two degrees in music, music education, stuff like that, but nothing to do. And nobody wants to hire in the middle of the school year and all that. So talk to the guy at the Taekwondo school and he's like, yeah, you can come work for me. Cause I used to teach classes at the other for my other instructor. So went working full time for him and that's okay, but it's not paying great bills for somebody who has two degrees. You would expect, you know, I've got student loans now I've got to start paying back. So, uh, my tube instructor from LSU helped me find a, a job down at a different university down the road from us. They needed an adjunct tuba professor and all that to teach some classes and lessons and also a I'm tuba doing prof- that's specific. Right. Yeah, tuba and euphonium, like the low brass guy yeah. and all that. So I drive two days a week to go spend most of the day there and teach some lecture classes for music history and private lessons and stuff like that. Then the other two or three days a week, I'd be over practicing, you know, running the martial arts studio and opening that up and doing all that stuff. But two jobs to try to pay my bills and still feels like I'm just caught between both worlds. And I talked to the the head instructor that I was teaching his classes for him and he helped me within that organization. They have hundreds of schools at that time. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a thousand. Um, He helped me find a a couple to to try out with that that said maybe we could pay him full time and and help him pay his bills here. So I ended up in Texas, back in Texas and at a school that had like seven, 800 students. So I was on staff with like four or five other people, you know, that were there eight o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, five days a week. Saturdays were half days, but you're still working six or eight, six hours at least, you know, if you don't have birthday parties and then Sundays sometimes coming in and I'm like, okay, so I'm wearing myself out and I'm barely paying my bills, mm-hmm. but my were truck got repoed. I wasn't really, you know, like I couldn't afford to pay to, for an, a, you know, a, a nice car or anything like that, a truck or anything. And no, after about two years, I was burnt out because I was, I was on list they were they were they were they were like we want to get to know you before we help pay for you to get out on your own so we're going to need a couple of years to kind of sure. get to know you and you know use you or whatever i guess you know that in my mind and right before i it was my time to go after i'd been there for about two years with this company uh, the guy before me was having troubles in the town that they had just set him up in and the, one of the other martial arts instructors in that town had done something with a minor or something that had made the word bad for martial arts and all that stuff. So they were they were struggling with his school and they're like, well, we need to put off a little longer. And I'm just like, this is pissing me off. Yeah. I've got, I've got more skills than you're paying me for, you know? And, and, and so I eventually, I left them, tried band directing for a couple of years and all that stuff uh, in, in some small towns. Which were you was, training at that point at all? Training where, when, when I went band to band directing? No, I, I stopped for those couple yeah, of years. I could see I'm that in your eyes. There's something about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really burn out, burn out on that part of it. Um, but it was, I mean, you're working for that many hours a day and you're teaching that many classes. I mean, you're, you're bound to just kind of learn real fast and a lot of stuff and, and have a bunch of experiences to grow from. So that was, it was fun and good in that, that aspect, but burnout kind of stuff too. That, that I realized afterwards when I wanted to get back into martial arts and I decided I wanted to start my own school, that I would never go that full mm. course ever again. So Monday through Thursday is all I'm ever going to do. <laughs> that's it if I'm teaching classes so uh it's it's fun but yeah band directing was interesting but coming from the first school district I got a, a teaching job at was kind of small and they hadn't had the you know as a band director or whatever I, I'm helping out at the, I'm teaching the middle school guy people myself and then I'm helping out at the high school with the marching band while well, they hadn't they hadn't had one of those flag corps with the girls mm. throw the flags and rifles and all that they hadn't had one of those in about 10 years and they wanted to restart that back up and I said I can teach that I've taught both staff. I can do that. Yeah. So yeah. sure enough, okay. They get a video with some lady showing us the actual like choreography that, that we're supposed to learn with the marching and all that. And I drilled it into those girls and they won more competitions. They get they, they scored higher competition than the marching band who'd been you know, playing their instruments for years. And uh, those girls were so pumped and excited they wanted to do it like year round. So we found an indoor competition thing that they could do and and, and figured that out. So what what was different? Let's let's talk about that for a second, because clearly something in your taekwondo background as training and instruction made an impact quickly. Right. What was that? What were you doing differently than they were used to? I can, I can break it down so easily. I can break down simple movements and I can, I can get them to, I can hide the repetition, disguise the repetition. Mm. I can motivate that better than most you high school teachers. Who, right. Exactly. That's what that's probably, I kept it basic. I kept it fun. So they're not going to learn like twirls and throws the first day, but once they get good with the rate, the basic things and all that stuff, I say, do you guys want to try up and then we'll, and we'll figure that out together. I might try it first and let them try it. And they, since they're twirling there every day and I'm not the one twirling every day, I'm just the one teaching, showing slow motion. They figured it out faster than I did. I'm like, good, do that again. <laughs> do it harder. You know, let's try it. And we just kept bumping it up and, and 
that's just how I love to do things. And that's what I find for me, teaching is, is fun because I feel like when I watch other people teach too, it kind of reinforces, I feel like I do it at a different level than a lot of other people because I've learned that, how to stair stack things. I don't try to put huge expectations on beginner students and all that from day one. Hey, you're not going to remember five different things right now. You know, and when you're teaching a drum line, I had I, I taught the, at the middle school to band and I'm teaching the sixth grades. They wanted to do a separate little drum line competition. So sixth graders who'd never touched a stick in their life like that. OK, we're working on basics, you know, day one and getting them done. But by the end of a the semester, they're they're scoring like third place at their competition and stuff like that against other people. So it was fun. And it's just learning those basics. If I can figure out the basic and, and look at it, and stare at it for a second or two well enough. And I've always probably been pretty good just from all the experience in martial arts I've done yeah. and kind of seeing and then figuring it out quickly how to do it. Okay. Then I can teach that. I can figure out how to break that down, you know? Yeah. So it's, that, that's helped a lot. That, that was kind of my experience teaching gymnastics. Oh goodness. I, I, yeah. I, I was at a, uh, an adult rec program and about two months in the, the owner of the gym who had been a, a national level coach, like not in the U S but, He's from Eastern Europe, so that gives you an idea. Uh, he said, I want you to teach the boys program. And I went, you're funny. And I came back the next week. He said, so when do you want to start? I said, wait, you were serious? I thought that was a joke because I didn't do gymnastics as a kid. Right. And he said, no, I've seen the way you move. And I know you're a martial artist. I know you can figure this out. And so I did essentially the same thing. That's awesome. And, you know, these are 8 to 12-year-old boys who – half of them were fearless, right? So we're on trampolines and things and they started better than I was. Right. And so how do you help them get better? Well, you break down the movement. Okay. What are we trying to do? Where are you? What is it that you need to tuck or pull or rotate or spot? You know, it's all skills that we have in martial arts, right. but now we're just applying them differently. I've, I've said it on the show many times. There's only so many ways the human body can move and, there are only so many ways that make sense through the lens of, of combat. Well, right. there are only so many that make sense through cheer or marching band or gymnastics, right? right. It's, it's the same arms and legs. We're just, how are we applying that, that understanding of our body? And for me, it's kind of, it's, it's setting them up for success because that's the only way they're going to want to continue practicing and continue getting better. So like you were saying, like you, you, and going back to like drummers or music like piano, I tell my students all the time, look, being a black belt sounds fancy and all that stuff. But and, and a lot of times they're making things look easy right now. You're struggling to think about stances when I'm trying to have you just doing stances, walking down the floor. And then I bump it up a level and say, OK, now let's add a punch to it or something like so. Now you're thinking about two things. OK, but my black belts have been doing, doing this for so long. And after a while, I added more things to them. So breathing, hand foot timing. Twisting the hips, twisting the hands at the last second, those types of things, yeah. explosiveness, so relax, explode, that kind of stuff. I said, it's like a drummer. He's not just thinking about one stick and one thing. You know, eventually he adds both sticks together and then he adds his foot pedals and he's got cymbals and then you're going. He's, you don't he's, start he's picturing all that stuff in his head. But a beginner drummer, one stick, one hand, right. then the other stick in one hand at the same time, you know, or a pianist, same thing. They're doing one hand, then they do the other by itself, then they eventually add them together foot pedals and dynamics and phrasing and all it's just it's crazy but they make it look easy after a while yeah but they sure didn't start thinking about all those and that's kind of what the whole process process of progressing is is just learning to add those different layers to where it doesn't overwhelm you anymore it's funny you you, you talk about playing music you know which is not my world but and that you know one hand or two hands or you know then adding the feet because i do some of that with sparring with my new students you know i'll start them and just say I don't even care what your stance is. I don't even want you to use your feet. I just want you to use your hands and not fall over. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, and for some of them, that's, <laughs> that's difficult enough. Right. And I find when we can disguise the repetition, keep it fun, and really narrow up what they're working on, right? People who've done seminars with me know this is the heart of what I teach. It's, you know, how do we, how do we hyper simplify to the point of success and then stack? And if we can do that with everything, how do we break it down that simple that they're all but guaranteed successful repetitions? Right. And then we don't need as much time before we add the next thing. That's the way to do it. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, so you, you've, you're taking a break from training. You're off your band director. You're, you're doing some other stuff with the, with the students in a, in a non-martial way. You're seeing success. You're having fun. 
that's why. Uh, See, this is why I like doing it in person because I can. Right. You know, I can't do that on. I can't do that over Zoom. It's like sneak attack. Yeah. Uh, so I got one of the the last school district I taught at as a band director was even smaller than the one I was at before. Uh, they had fired a husband and wife team that were working together at both campuses in middle school and high school because they were yelling at each other and cussing at each other at the kids. <laughs> so they're like, they need to go, and we need just something that's a little bit healthier atmosphere. So let's let's just do one person to see if we can sure. you know stretch them between both. And I did that, and that was fine. But I'm like, okay, so even though you're a small school district, I come from a place with high expectations. So here's what I'm thinking, sure. and 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 I'll put a, I'll put together a band handbook like most band directors have for middle schools for high schools. It's going to have Here's my rules and my expectations. You're going to have practice cards and all that stuff, like for beginning band students, because that's what I grew up with and kind of set an Sounds like a martial arts school to me. Right. You need to have that. You need to know to do it. And the school board signed off on it. I had the meeting with the parents before school started. Parents signed off on it. Six weeks into class, half the kids are failing band because they're not turning in any kind of practice record and all that stuff. Parents are calling into the school going, why is my kid getting a zero in that class? This should be an easy class. Your kid's not doing anything to help himself in this class, which I keep reminding him of. Principal comes to me, says, you can't fail any kids in band. We're not going to allow it. Nobody can make less than an 85. I said, that's not ethical, and that's I, I don't agree to that. They signed this sheet. Yeah. You signed off on it before I handed it to yeah. them. They signed off on it. So no, and they said, well, we're going to have to let you go then. <laughs> They'd rather lose a teacher <laughs> with high expectations and ethics than give in. hold the kids accountable. Right, exactly. What so, year was this? Around 2005, 2006, yeah, something like that. that. Starts to track. Right. <laughs> and then, so I left that. Uh, I didn't want to be around people anymore. My brother runs a pretty successful lawn landscape company down in Texas. So I'm like, hey, I'm moving back home. Can you can you put me to work? So, yeah, sure. We'll figure something for you. I worked for him for a couple of years. Uh, still not training. Still not training. Physical job, so I didn't sure. really feel like I needed to. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have yeah, any energy at the end of the night. Eventually got into a, 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 an office type job uh, where I was sitting more of the days and stuff like that where I wasn't outside and all that stuff and it was kind of nice, but just sitting and, and feeling like I'm getting flabby and, and all that stuff. So after a couple of years of that, I'm like, I really need to find something to get back in exercise. At that point in time, I transferred to a place back in Louisiana up in like Shreveport, Bossier City area and, uh, with a management job and all that. And I found a martial arts school there that did the same type of forms I did in a different way, but they still did Chunji, Dangun, and all that. They were a mile-high karate studio with Stephen Oliver's group and all that stuff, and, and uh, doing Taekwondo, and I'm like, hey, I know that stuff. So I went and watched a little bit, and I'm like, okay, that's cool, and it wasn't like super-duper hardcore competitive. I'm like, this feels like a safe place for me to start coming back and being active. Yeah. I start working out there a little bit, and, and I start helping some of the junior students who are struggling, and, and the, the owner's like, hey, man, I'm kind of I've got real bad arthritis. I don't really move well anymore. Would you have, would you like to start teaching some classes? And so. <laughs> How long had it been in between training when you started training there? It sounds like six, eight years. Yeah, about six years, so yeah. six, something like that. So it's been a little while, but it all comes back to you. you know, How did it feel stepping back on the mats? Nice, yeah. honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even think I'd say nervous or anything like that. It was just, just kind of nice. Like, this is where I, my home is. So I love that. I, I love those kind of atmospheres of those places. So I did that for a few, a few years with him and, and uh, then was looking for something a little bit more job-wise, career-wise and all that stuff and, and was trying to start thinking, okay, what if I ventured out on my own and started my own place because he was trying to sell his school and, and move on because he was, like I said, his body shutting down and stuff like that. But uh, I couldn't afford to buy his school from him. I'm thinking about like bootstrapping, so like small dojo, big profits kind of stuff, you know. Uh, and an opportunity came up here in Kansas City where I have some family, some cousins that lived up here. I came to one of their weddings one time in the fall, and it was just beautiful. I'm like, what, you guys get all four seasons up here? <laughs> I've just been growing up in the South my whole life, and, you know, occasionally they took a you know family vacation down to Mexico or came out. I just thought the whole world was hot all the time, you know. <laughs> so I'm like, this is I'm amazing. I'm to Vermont. <laughs> right, it's yeah. hot not, like two weeks a year. There's a, a joke a friend of mine told me shortly after moving to Vermont. He said, you know, people ask me, what do you do in Vermont in the summer? And I tell them we usually take that weekend off, that week off for vacation. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I would love that. My wife loves the heat and the, and, and the, and the humidity and all that. And so she's happiest in the summer here. 
and she won't even turn the AC on in our house. And I'm like, I'm like, baby, I, when I get home, I got to have something. <laughs> but I love the winter. I can always get warmer. I can always wear layers. And if I need to, when we go inside and it's cooler, I can take a layer off or something and work out. But, uh, man, so I loved it up here. I wanted to move up here and, and chance to kind of start fresh, start brand new. And uh, first year or so I was here, I was kind of looking around different parts of town. Okay, mm -hmm. where is their growth? Where can I, where would be a smart, type, smart place? And eventually I found place that would let me use their space in the evenings and, and all that a couple nights a week and, and uh, so I started trying trying to start a program up there I had the curriculum and all that already set in my head I'd already made some a bunch of YouTube videos for it and all that I kind of had it all set up and on paper and, and all that too but uh, just the growth from there that was about five years ago when I started trying to do that and, and within a one mile radius of where I was trying, there was at least six hundred martial arts schools that had been open for ten plus years yeah. that were well established and all that stuff. So, getting a bunch of new people when something it's new tough. like that's opening up wasn't because it wasn't really new in that yeah. town. Uh, so, found a different location in a different part of town about a year and a half or two years into that, and just moved over there. None of my students came from from that first. I only had five students at that first location, so none of they all they all kind of quit and. and went on to other places that I, I was like, I'll, happy to, I'll be happy to help you find a yeah. good, helpful place around here, but I, I'm going to try to find somewhere else and, and now. Because the, there is a business component. You do have to pay the bills. Right, right. At least, right? <laughs> so, yeah, and now now I'm, and this is my first, I've been about six months or so now, I found an actual uh, full-time location where I don't have to remove, remove my mats each night after classes and all that, and no one else is using the space, no other dance studio or anything like that. So we we tried to go to four nights a week and all that to expand my schedule. And it's, the people are liking it, the kids, are, but the, the town doesn't know I'm there yet still. You know, so trying to get advertising and, and signage and stuff like that. My landlord time. and I are kind of button heads. He doesn't want signage up in front of his pretty new building and stuff like that to block the view. And I'm, the, I'm the trying view to get the, the building. Right. And I'm trying to get the point across to you need your tenants to pay your, your rent, right? So you want them to grow. <laughs> So I, I've never run into that, but some of the other people I've talked to in the martial arts world be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've had ten, I've had landlords that are just weird like that. That For whatever reason, they fight you on those stupid small things like signage and putting things in your windows so people will know you're there. And I'm, I'm, I've never heard of that in my life. Yeah, that's a weird one. <clears throat> so that's a bit of a struggle. But five years in now, I've got 20 students. And they're, they're it's a lot better than five. Right, definitely. They're happy, and, and I'm not giving so much away for free as I used to. I used to give them their uniforms and their sparring gears and all that stuff for, yeah. for free and all that, and I was just losing money, but I was considering it kind of a hobby back then. I wasn't trying to think, you know, I wasn't super serious about I'm going to make this a full-time thing one day. I just want to have fun with it. I want to teach people. Well, now in the last year or so, I'm like, no, I, I need to stop losing money every year. And I started looking back at my taxes, and three years ago, I was $20,000 in the hole, Two years ago, I was twelve to fifteen thousand, I think, in the hole that I was losing money, and I felt like my own personal money coming yeah. out of that. I'm like, oh, that that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I start looking at it and paying attention. I'm like, okay, we need to change some things. This thing needs to start making money. Even with twenty students, it needs to pay the bills at least, you know, and, and, and all that. It doesn't have to pay me a salary or anything yet, but it's it's more fun of a hobby now, at least if you're going to call it that, because I'm not stressed about it. And I'm not losing money with it. It's they're helping me. It's a huge step. The there's there's on. something. Um, you know, the, the data out there isn't great, but it seems like roughly half of the martial arts schools in the U.S. are not profitable. That That's somewhere in that ballpark. Could be 40, could be 60, right? But right. somewhere around half. So you're not in bad company. And if anybody out there in the audience has a school and, and they're feeling like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm losing money. Well, you're, you're not alone, right? right? It doesn't mean you can't turn it around. It also doesn't mean you have to change that, right? Because how many of us have a hobby and that doesn't pay us, right? I mean, most hobbies don't make you money. Right. But, as long as you're not losing money on it. But if, yeah, if you could have a hobby that puts a few bucks in your pocket and connects you with the good people and you feel good about what you do at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want anybody to, out, out there to think that that's a problem or it's inherently wrong. Right. Yeah, I, I've, en I've enjoyed it. And it's, it's, it's nice not being as stressed. Mm. Um, and it's nice trying to learn how to make it a bit. But, I mean, I for years... Since I decided I was going to branch off and start my own thing, I, I was reading all those small dojo, big profits, Mike Massey things and his podcasts and every every trying to absorb every bit of information in that world that I could um, reading and all that. And I'm just it's been like so many things in my life. I watch people and go, I could do that. But then when I step into those shoes, it doesn't happen as easily or just doesn't doesn't get there. I'm seeing them after they're already established. And I'm like, 
I did, but I didn't see day one, you know, when they were struggling or something like that. And I'm like, oh, five years in, it shouldn't be this. It should be happening soon, you know. And, and so that's the challenge for me is mentally trying to stay with it. Uh, well, it's 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 like training too, right? How many how many people start training because they saw something cool, right? They saw somebody in a movie. They saw something. I mean, the Olympics are going on right now. Where right. where we were having all oh, having dinner last night. You know, judo was on the TV. Um, I think I, I think they were running taekwondo as we were leaving. Oh, really? I think I saw that. Uh, and you can watch those folks and say, okay, you know, yeah, I see what they're doing. And you show up and you start training. And first off, statistically, you're probably never going to be that good, no matter <laughs> how hard you work, because right. it's the Olympics. Right. But even if you just want to be decent, how many days a week and how many hours and for how long right. is that? And how many hours and days and years do you have not teaching? That's a whole different skill set than growing the school, right? right? Mar teaching martial arts, running a martial arts school is, is, I mean, we've got the business side, which we're the only industry I know of where a good portion of people will wear their lack of financial professional success as a badge of honor. I only have seven students, but they've been with me for, you know, 13 years right. and they're really dedicated and, and they tell themselves a story that, well, it's because I'm too difficult to train. I'm like, I'm old school, right? Or because I don't want to have a big commercial school or, or, you know, people throw the word McDojo. I don't, I don't want to be a McDojo. Being a McDojo doesn't have to mean that you, you can't pay your bills, right. right? Like there's a lot of middle ground here. I don't even like the term McDojo. It's a whole other conversation. <laughs> right. And then of course we've, we've got the aspect where we're also, to my knowledge, the only industry that says, okay, you know how to do this. You must know how to teach it, right? You're, you're a teacher, right? right. right? Like no, how, you went to school, you understand, okay, teaching a thing is different than doing a thing. Right. And yet when you started teaching, at martial arts, it was simply because you could do, and your instructor said, go do this. But right. I'm assuming there was at least some guidance in oh, there. Sure. Yeah, right? a big learning period and all that But stuff. there are plenty of people who, you know, they have a falling out with their instructor or they reach a certain rank and it's just expected you go off on your own. And those people find them. And, and that's why, you know, you, you mentioned Mike Massey, and there's so many resources out there now. And why do we need this level of resources? Because we need this level of resources. You know, yeah. We do our own things in that space. Because we got to, yeah, and we need those hours of time to practice. But it, and it kind of reminds me, like, not, I don't know if we connect this to the business aspect, but kind of going back to, like, one of our seminars yesterday, uh, uh, Wyatt did the ballet for martial artists, yeah. you know, how to get explosive. Yeah, we're going to talk to, like, talk to Wyatt next. I don't know the order that. we're going to run these, but love yeah. that. And, and I, I, I asked him at the end, it's like, this isn't really necessarily about the power for martial arts and all that. But I said, I've always been jealous, of, especially nowadays, cause you can pull it up on social media and you see these reels of gymnastics kids and dance kids and these little eight and 10 year old girls that are torturing themselves, sitting there doing the splits, trying to lift things up with the, lift their feet up off the ground in the splits but they've got books or something on each foot and all that stuff. And they're doing this crazy hard stuff. And there's a room full of them, just like an army of girls. Yeah. And I, I'm struggling to get nine and 10 year old boys to do something other than, you know, I'm like, come on, man, put some effort into it. You know, don't you want to bust this board or something? And, and, and it, I try to encourage them to practice at home and try to give them challenges to do to, to, to make them practice at home. But no, but then you see these, you know, gymnasts and girls with those six pack abs and they're, they're watching their diet and they're exercising every day. And, and it just made me remember, like I had a teenage uh, a cousin one time that she was so into dance and we go, I go visit her sometimes, uh, her family and all that. And we go shopping at Walmart and she's doing dance moves up and down the aisle. Like yeah. that. And I'm like, I used to be like that with Taekwondo. Yeah. I'm sitting there hitting tree limbs and stuff like that when we're working, trying to work on my, my, my twist in my wrist and, yeah. and trying to see if I can kick even in my jeans and all that. Can I kick that one, that leaf right there or something? And I was having so much fun with it. it the practice was, so so much throughout the day but it wasn't really practice it was just i'm doing moves because i love it and that's the same thing like my, my cousin did and i need to get and i'm so jealous because it seems like there's such a i don't know if that's the right way to say it, like cult following with with dance elite dance and, yeah. and, and gymnasts it's it's a lifestyle it, it's it's really difficult to for from from my observation right and obviously there are some regional differences and everything but 
you know, when you think about dance, when you think about gymnastics, you get the kids coming in three, four, five, right? And they're learning really basic fundamental skills. And they're disguising a lot of repetition within body conditioning, right? right? And then that's the point where, you know, maybe six, seven, eight, they start to split. Is this going to be a thing that I do once or twice a week for fun? And they don't tend to hang there too long. Or is this the thing that we do, right? Are we a dance family? Are we a gymnastics family in the same way? You know, I'm, I'm from Vermont. We have hockey families, oh, right? If, like if, you're, if your family... Hmm? I was thinking lumberjack families or something. Do they um, have lumberjacks up in Vermont? <laughs> We, we, we do, but they're not usually using axes, right? They're usually <laughs> using some really big, crazy equipment. I mean, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I mean, there you go. Maybe that's your marketing <laughs> now, right? You got to get outside and you got to chop some, chop some wood, right? I mean, y'all don't burn firewood down here, right? Too often, yeah, you know, but, but, you know, if somebody yeah. said, you know, I'll, I'll drop off a couple quarts of firewood that I, I chopped with my hand, you know, it might be a few grand versus a few hundred dollars, but that'd be a cool marketing gimmick. But the hockey family still, but it's, like it's, that too. It's if that you're doing it, lifestyle. you're doing it right. Like it's, what are you doing this weekend? Well, you know, it's this kid's, this team's tournament <clears throat> weekend. Right. right. And they're just, it's, it's what they do. And I, I think there, there's an identity wrapped in with that, that when you were a kid, martial arts was your identity. When I was a kid, when, when, Right, like it was your identity. We we have we have an audience, right? Victor and Karen are over there, and what you're talking about is without that identity, without that all encompassing, it becomes really tough. Now, if we're talking about young kids, that's not coming from them, right? Right, a, a five year old isn't saying, "I want to do this one thing forever and only and always." No five year old says that, right? But the parents say. You made a commitment. This you said you wanted to do this. This is what we do, and so they just show up. And it can happen, but you know, it's. I, I think what you're talking about, a lot of martial arts schools are experiencing, right? That's, this idea that martial arts is a thing that some people do sometimes, right. not an identity. That's where that's where I love to figure out how to crack that code. So I, I've got a suggestion, and, uh, and I've, and I've offered this up to a lot of schools. Actually, Victor, we've talked about this. This idea that if you if you think about what martial arts provides, for, forget about rank for a moment, forget about a lot of these things. If you look at martial arts as a physical and personal growth program. Right, like the life skills and the health and benefits. And, and you know, you, you mentioned one of the most passionate youth sports demographics I'm aware of, boys football. If you ran a six week martial arts for football kids that ran prior to preseason over the summer, it, it, it takes connecting with the coach and the athletic director. But if you can run those sorts of camps and skill development, hmm. because if you take a look at high end pro athletes, right? This is one of the things that, that as whistle kick grows, I really hope we end up with the resources to do. I want someone to be able to, on, on my team to be able to dig through and say, OK, we know this is the general uh, participation rate of martial arts for adults. Here's the participation rate of pro basketball players, pro hockey, pro football. Right. We know that right. there's a lot in there. We know that a lot of, you know, we, we had Wyatt's class yesterday, free training day, right. ballet. Right. There are a lot of pro athletes that have done dance, not necessarily as youth, but Oh, this is another way of me uh, uh, helping my body. Right. You talk to any college level, college level athletic trainer, they will tell you that the kids that are most injury prone are the ones that have been single sport right. from a very young age, right? right? So when you start to approach some of these things from those angles, there's a whole demographic that I think we as an industry miss, which is temporary. Right. Yeah, I like that. I, I've talked to some of the sports coaches around in, in the school district that I've just moved to, I've, I've touched base with them and I've let them know, look, I've had experience in that exact field. When I was uh, going to, at LSU for my master's, the, the guy I was doing, the Taekwondo, Taekwondo school owner I was doing stuff with there, had an in with Nick Saban at the time, who was the coach and all that. And, and so on the off season, we got invited to come over and teach his football team the stretches and some fun little target drills and stuff like that. Our team black belts would show them their jump, spin, flip kicks and all that and show off for them. And they loved that. Yep. But it, it, 
it was just it was fun. They they had fun. They got to move in a different way, and it was it was really interesting to see because like the linemen, these guys could lift a Mack truck. But you ask them, okay, now we're just going to try to do the do the splits. Just stand up and just kind of you don't have to fall all the way down to the floor. And they wouldn't. They refused to go past forty five degrees. They're like, man, I can't do it. I can't do it. I walk up to them and I kind of nudge their foot out a little bit, and they freak out. Their eyes get real big, but they go down to ninety degrees. They're like, oh. Man, I'm doing it. Hey, hey, look, Ralph, I'm doing it. You know, and they start talking to each other, and they're all proud of that, you know. So he kept – Saban kept that uh, that stretching routine we taught them and we had them doing. Uh, he kept that as their stretching routine for the next football season, and that was the year they tied whatever BCS championship. But they'd had – he had reported back to us that they'd had the fewest injuries that season that he's ever had in his career. And, and so, yeah, I, I try to use that with coaches that I'm talking to, and I said, I'd be happy to come out and do a, a, you know, a, a class or something and, and with your – your, your football team, your basketball team, whatever, and kind of show them our stretch routine and have them do some fun stuff. But I've just kind of been limited in my mind to one class. I wasn't thinking about, hey, what if we had a program right before the, the, the season actually starts? If, if, if I, I think camps, right? Anybody out there, if you're a parent, you know how expensive camps are. If you're someone who, who runs camps as part of your martial arts program, it's probably one of the more lucrative aspects of what you do. And, and you know, that might right. be an area that you look at growing into. But, you know, when I think football – Almost every, I'm not a, a passionate football fan, but it's very casual. But every position, I see a place where martial arts plays a role. Offensive line, they're sparring, right? right? Exactly. Like they can't, they can't grab, but they're, I mean, they're sparring. They're, they're palm healing. Right. The D line exactly. is they're trying to come in. If I make those hands faster and more accurate, how does that not help my team? Right. Right. And oh, we actually had a number of classes yesterday that were around awareness. Tell me that every single position isn't better when they're more aware, right? So I, 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 think, I think there's a lot there and I hope that we as an industry start to embrace that because it's the gateway drug, right? It's the, right. It's the first one's free, right? You, you, oh, okay, so I can correlate, I did this thing, it made me better at football, but it was also a lot of fun. So when the season's over, maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that a whirl. And I, I think what we need to do as an industry to, to, to allow that is not shame people when they treat martial arts like a, a, a seasonal sport. You know, it's, do we want them there all the time? Of course we do. Right. But people have a really hard time with things that don't end. Right? That, that ongoing, yeah. inevitable commitment. The world doesn't work that yeah. way too often anymore and i've seen it both ways i've seen instructors that kind of shame them a little bit and say no you look you either got to commit to this or whatever or, or if you leave don't come back kind of thing and i've seen instructors that are real welcoming and open and i've always loved i've always appreciated the welcoming and open open mind. you know i had uh, one organization i was with a while back i won't say any of them but uh first time i got to meet at one of their grandmasters in person he was giving a lecture leading a seminar to a group and all that and he had us all sitting down I'm in the back of the room because I'm the lowest rank, only like second degree or something at the time. And uh, he's telling a story, and it's funny, but where I came from, grandmasters, are, are you know, they can tell jokes and stuff, and we, we can be nice and polite to each other. So I'm sitting there nodding my head at him, and I'm smiling at him, and he stops what he's saying in the middle of it. He goes, what are you doing? I said, not, you know, not that your joke. You're, you're telling something funny. And 50 push-ups, now. I'm like, what? 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 <laughs> And they're punishing me for doing something other than just saying, yes, sir, and was, being was, obedient was your like a military. Joe Pesci from Goodfellas? <laughs> Felt like it at the moment. And I, I was just like, whatever, man. You really, <laughs> if you really need to feel that, that big and that strong by yeah. making, you know, just, whatever. Oh, and that was not a, a vibe I ever wanted to pass yeah. on to my students or their parents or anything like that. So I've always appreciated the ones that were more welcome. And I find that eventually they will come back. I've got one kid now that got so close to black belt, he got to red belt. And his mom's like, look, we've got him in uh, piano lessons and swim lessons. And he's got to do his homework. We got him in something like soccer or something like that and, and all that. And he really knows he, he loves doing your Taekwondo stuff, but he knows he needs to commit more time to it. And he just can't do it because we've got him in all these other things. So we're going to take a break. We'll come back in the summer. And I'm like, I, I understand. You know, I want him to be here. You know, I want him to be good at all those things, too. I'll just remind you, you know, just yep. there's things at those classes that, while they're really good. And I'm a musician, too, and I appreciate that, too. There's lessons here that he yep. learns that he won't get anywhere else. But yes, please bring him back whenever you can, you know. And I, I'm still waiting for him to come back. But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna send out every now and then texts or yeah. say reminders. Say, yeah, hey, just, we're still thinking about you. How's Kai doing or something like that? But I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna shame him and be, be like, you disgrace. 
you know how much you're letting your kid down. <laughs> we know, you know. One of the one of the things that I I see some schools doing, and I want to see more schools doing this, uh, especially for the youth, is assessments, subjective assessments, having the parents, you know, scoring. You know, your kid comes in mm. on a scale of you know one to whatever, one to five, one to three, one to ten. Um, how focused is your kid? How disciplined are they? How uh, how well do they listen at home? Right, like all the soft skills that really are what parents want right. of their kids, and then every three to six months have them fill that out again. Right. Have so you seen it improve. Or so anything? yeah. So because like sometimes that. we have to help people understand the value. Because if it's you know, let's say it's music. If, if the kids playing piano and they're playing piano at home, it's really easy to know that that kid's gotten better because you don't hate listening to them. Right. Right. When they're practicing, they're like, oh, my God. OK, <laughs> if it's um, if it's a seasonal sport, it has an end point. There's a there's a built in uh, things become more valuable when they're scarce. Right. So so there's that component to it. If if it's, um, you know, if you're if you're lifting weights, right, you're 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 you see that the, the weights get stronger and maybe your, your clothes fit differently, right? Like there are a lot right. of different ways that people evaluate, but especially in a school where the parents aren't watching, they don't have the context for what marks better in, in, in progress within martial arts. They don't right. know. Right. They're scoring it entirely on how the kid responds when they say, all right, it's time to get ready for class. Right. And if the kid's knee deep in playing Minecraft, doesn't matter what you're asking them to do. They don't want to get ready for class. They want to keep doing the thing that they're doing that they're enjoying. Exactly. And if they if they can't see enough value in the progress to offset that, you know, because they're 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 pushing them to do it, well, hmm. eventually they're gonna they're gonna tap out. I yeah, I think that might be somewhere I could I can improve on. Uh, I might be like dropping the ball and trying to make them aware of that more aware of that. I have been trying to do more. So when I first was was doing classes two days a week and all that stuff, class, the testing, belt testings and all that would just be during their normal class time on, on the Thursday of that week or something, uh, the, the last week of our cycle and all that. Uh, and and I, that's not how I grew up doing it, but I do just what was I felt was easier for me or something at that time. Um, then I kind of started thinking back to my belt test. I'm like, no, there's 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 something to be seen for. I want to see my kids a white or yellow belt right now. I haven't seen what the green belts look like when they're sparring and whatever, or the black belts when they're doing their cool stuff. So there's something about that that we need to we need to show the progression and all. So now lately, the last couple the last year or so, I've been making sure that we're we're doing that. We're, we're belt test for everybody starts at this time. Five and six year olds go first, and if they need to leave, go after that. But everybody else that wants to you know, stay and watch the, all the way to the black belts and board breaks and and all that stuff. And I'm trying to make throughout the test, make pointers to the parents. Hey, this little this blue belt right here started with me in the five and six year old class. He's been with me for about two years now or something. And look at him now. Remember how ordinary you were when you started, you know, crazy, you were jumping off the walls and all that stuff. And look at him now. He's standing still with tension and he's, he's breaking boards. It's a testing, but it's a, it's a celebration. Right. As well, actually. I try to make, so I try to make that point there and that's yeah. every, every three months or something, but kind of asking their input on what they're seeing at home or outside. Yeah. I, I really like that. I really like that. One of the presenters yesterday, who she's been on the show, I think multiple times. Yeah, I know multiple times. Kelly Thomas. She recently, if I remember correctly, made this change recently. Her testings are now called leveling up. <laughs> okay. And, like and I like that, right? Because yeah. the word test can, can be intimidating to people. Right. But I think it also, test is for the person who is training. Leveling up could be for anybody. It's it's game day, right? Come, right. come watch, come celebrate, come be a... a, a an accessory part of this event that let's like face that. it that no no kid is training without the parent <clears throat> right the parent has to at least approve it let alone drive them pay for it laundry right like they're they're right. involved so keeping them involved i think can be really important on that front i have been trying to do better than than what i've seen in, in my experience growing up other martial arts schools keeping people out in the lobby behind a glass wall whatever just let your kid watch or the kid the parents are out in the parking lot on their phone while the kid's in class or something I've been trying to pull the parents out on the mat. So if I do a, mm. a 12 week cycle where we're working on techniques and all that for 12 full weeks, because when I grew up, it was eight weeks. And nowadays that seems a little bit too fast for me for the attention span and the amount they're actually practicing. So I'm, I'm trying to expand that and give them a little bit better time, more time to look better. But the first month of that, anytime they're learning a new technique, I'm pulling the parents out on the mat to hold the target for them. So they're learning oh, yeah. 
Yeah. How? Okay. And what are you looking for on this? Oh yeah. See that back foot has to turn. I need to see that pivot all the way, or see where his knees pointing, or something. That way, they're learning not only how to hold that, but now, okay, when I'm encouraging them to help their kid practice at home and be a partner in that practice, yeah. you know. And I've gotten good feedback from that. More parents saying, "Yeah, we're working on that. He's still not pivoting, or he's jumping too late, or something like that," you know. Uh, but that first like four weeks or so, that's the, the parents are heavily involved and. Yeah. and think they're liking that. I don't really have a whole lot of parents that stay out in the parking lot at all. They're they're all at least in the room now when That's they're in something. class. And whenever we're You're working on stuff the that they're struggling, their kids struggling on, I'm kind of, I'm like, hey, Jim, watch this. Watch what he's doing. And, and just at home, this is what needs to happen. Yeah. I don't have them behind a glass wall or anything like that because I want them to be able to hear that conversation. And, and occasionally, I'm just going to ask questions and be like, so what's your word for the cycle? Integrity? Okay, what's that mean? And he tells it, he tells it. And I said, so dad? Is he doing that at home or, you know, mm. is he doing that with sister? You know, is he being courteous to sister or something? You know? yeah. And uh, you're kind of getting feedback a little bit from there. And they're yeah. like, okay, that's what, that's why it's your word for this cycle. You yeah. need to be working on that. Yeah. You know? I want to hear good stories. So. Um, it, it's funny. We keep talking about people who were at free training day yesterday, but um, Craig Wareham, who, I don't know, I think you, Victor, you and Craig are fighting it out for most appearances. On martial arts radio, I don't know who's in the lead right now. Yeah. He he's in the lead still. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I don't know if we're counting you as this is an appearance right now. I don't know if your voice made it to the microphone. Um, sorry, Craig, but his school has done. I don't know if they're still doing it, but has done a class for parents who are not training to help them understand those those sorts of things you're talking about. This is what we're looking for. This is how you can encourage, coach them. The regular thing, home. like each cycle or like every week or something? Uh, I, I think it's it, it was meant to be more of a one-off, right? Like, here's how you can be a good martial art parent. <clears throat> right. And because if, if, if they're not training, they don't know what they're looking for. So right. if, if it's, you know, go practice your form and the kid's six, right? Like they're looking to the parent for some feedback and the right. parent, like, I don't know what this is. I do it a little bit differently. We have family classes. We run our kids' class. We run our adult class. In the middle, there's the family class. Hmm. which allows for some overlap for, you know, and admittedly, most of the families don't participate in that. Right. But how many things are there? My, my philosophy is how many things are there for parents to do with their kids? Exactly. There's not a lot. So um, I just, the last two leads that we took in, one was a family of five, you know, six, eight, and 11, and the two parents, and they're all interested. There, there's probably nothing else that five of them are going to be able to do together. That's going to be a blast. Right. Are they going to, is it going to be the most effective training for them? No. And I tell them right off the bat, right? Like I want to see the kids in the kids class and I want to see the adults in the adult class, at least sometimes because right. the way I, I, we're going to teach something to a six year old in a 30 something, it's kind of different. Right. We're going to, somebody's going to get compromised somewhere in there, but you know, it's fun. Right. Like, like my philosophy, make sure they have fun and then learn something. Right? If you follow that order, it tends to work out. Educate and entertain, right? All yeah. <laughs> Connect, yeah. educate, and entertain. I, I agree. And, and being open to those type of things and being flexible and all that stuff. So yeah. I don't officially have a, a family class, but I do have a mom that's a business owner that uh, at some point she's been trying to help her kid for the last year or so that he's been with me. She's been trying to help him practice at home and all that stuff. Nice. And at some point I'm like, you know what? It, it might just make more sense to you if you got a uniform on and all that. Yeah, but I don't have the time. I can't. I don't have the money. To do. We're, we're struggling with our business right now. I said, that's fine. So I'll give you the uniform. You're you're always talking me up to your friends and your people yeah. at church, and you're trying to find ways to yeah. help connect people to me. And also, that's that's enough for me for now. So just cut, you know, come to class, and if you can make it to the adult class, that's kind of, that's fine. But if the only time you have is when you bring him, if you're okay being on the mat with a bunch of kids and all that stuff, yeah. I'll make it work for you. I'll still make you. I'll, I'll get you to learn. But yeah, that, and she's she's loving that now. Good. So now she's getting to learn and. Tra and she has more of an idea. He's still a couple belts ahead of her. So, yeah. so it's, and kids love that. <laughs> kids love when they're better at something than their parents. <laughs> right. They get to try to teach you something. Yeah. You know, and and so that's kind of I think helps solidify that relationship a little bit. You know, and, and make them even a little bit stronger than before. So I just I try to be open with it. You know, and, and I, I I I would love to see more martial arts instructors do that. It's just so much of this that comes down the ranks from military backgrounds yeah. and they, they get that attitude, but nobody wants to be talked to like that nowadays anymore. No one wants to be yelled at for saying, yep, instead of yes, sir. I mean, I might might get my eyes real big and go, what, what, what did you just say? Mm. And the kids always laugh and I'm like, you're about to see smoke come out my ears, man. <laughs> and they laugh and they're like, sorry, yes, sir, you know, but I got to kind of remind them every now and then, and that's fine, but we, we have fun with it instead of, give me 10 push-ups for that disrespectful tone or what, you know, I'm like, 
no, that's not that's not what I want to be, and that's not what I want my legacy of passing down. If anyone else continues martial arts after me or whatever, I don't want them to have that background, or, 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 or if they grow up and move away or whatever, and they they want to get their kids in martial arts, I'm, I don't want them to be scared. They're going to get yelled at from that instructor, or expect that that's an okay thing. The world know? is scary enough. We don't need to create a space that makes people afraid Agreed. to show up. Agreed. I love it though. It's it's a lot of fun. So what's next? Is 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 the goal that this becomes what you do full time? That's my goal lately. Okay. Yes, I right now the the the, the job I I've got had for the last couple of years or so is back to being outdoors, lawn and landscape type of stuff. Okay. It's a very physical job, and then trying to have energy or, or capabilities to teach classes in the yeah. evenings doesn't always work for me. And yeah, my body's I, I'm 45 years old now, and I. I, and I Mark got mad at me last night at dinner when I said this. I sit next to him. He's he's a lot older than I am, but I feel like I'm in my 60s internally. I, I think I'm catching some of that, like that last instructor I worked with that had a, a real bad arthritis. I think I'm kind of starting to understand where he's coming down with that because I, I can do something for 30 minutes at a time. I can do quick something, you know, demonstrations here and there, but I don't have the, the stamina to do it very long with before I'm, I'm like this or I'm walking. You know, I, I just showed off for my kids the other day in class. I'm like, look, testing's coming up this week. you got to be able to run through this. It needs to look like this. Boom, boom. Did all the jump kicks for him real fast, like in quick succession. But my blood was pumping, and I was like so excited. And two hours later, I'm, I'm, I'm walking down the stairs, and I'm baby, why are my legs hurting so bad? I need to have some salt bath. She goes, remember those stupid jumps you did in the class when you were getting down with the kids? And so I'm like, I love it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so it's front, front, of the, front of the room energy, right? There's, right. Something, there's something I was telling – I, who was I telling? I think I was telling my students that I remember this day really vividly. We're doing kneeling front kicks, right? So oh my kneel down, stand up, front kick. And I was probably 16, and I was running. I was running the kids' class, and you know we would normally do 10 on each side, or 15 on each side, or something. And and I, and I just kind of put out a challenge. I said, "How many can we do?" I had this one dang kid, and we ended up doing 50 on each side because he wouldn't quit, and I wasn't letting him do more than me because he was 12. Mm -hmm. It's this 12-year-old green belt, and here I was. Uh, I think I had just earned my black belt. Here I was a brown belt. And I remember, like, for the next two days, I couldn't walk because <laughs> 100 kneeling front kicks is a lot. Right? <laughs> Live and learn oh, those lessons, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, but at the I time. I'm in teaching shape now. I'm not in performance shape and practicing shape like I used to be, but... But I, I love it so much. I would love to turn this into a full-time thing, but that kind of means more learning the business side of things and sure. becoming a business owner and, and, and learning how to have eventually people teaching classes for me and under me so that way I can grow and work on you know, other things, other aspects of that and get in, in, in touch with more people in the community to try to grow our presence there. So that's the challenge now, and that's my, that's my new goal, my expectation. You know, It's like, okay... Black belt, fine. I created this curriculum uh, from from the Taekwondo that I grew up in, and some other things that I that I've seen and all that over the years. And uh, I'm loving what I'm teaching. I, I, I think it's real got real value to it and all that. Sure. But I need to get I need to grow its presence if it's going to pay the bills for me, and so that way I don't have to work an outside job physically every day where you know I'm doing stupid stuff that either kills my shoulders or pops my back or something like that. I pulled I pulled a muscle the other day couple weeks ago and for the next two days in classes I'm sitting on the sitting on those shield mats against the wall like that go do that do that again and switch your feet over here and <laughs> trying to do it from yeah. sitting down and they were real patient with me the kids were and they're like can I can I grab that for you you know when I drop something <laughs> but I don't want to be teaching classes like that every day I want to be and, and that's what I love about martial arts is, is I did a little bit of soccer basketball football things like that baseball when I was growing up and all that and, and I enjoyed it for a time but it wasn't anything that really got me going and I don't really see adults doing a whole lot of intramural soccer baseball football basketball you know and all that stuff anymore as 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 they get older and all that stuff you know I want adults something that move. I can keep going and, right I want to yeah, be active. you need adults to move more <laughs> exactly. I had my grandparents when they were in their 70s maybe early 70s they they had been sitting down so much that their, their ankles were like swelling up and all that it hurt them to walk uh, they eventually got those little ride-on wheelchair things and all those electric. And I don't want to be that. I looked at that as I, as a kid, and I'm like, wow, if that's what getting older. But then I go, I'm in the martial arts world, and I see 60-year-olds out there doing forms and kicking pads and breaking boards. I'm like, that's what I want to be like. Keep moving, I'm, and you'll be able to keep moving. Object exactly, in motion. Exactly. 
that's my goal. So whatever it is, keep the business moving, keep myself moving. I would love for it to be the thing. I've got all these ideas that have come up in the last couple of years, you know, try to, I named my business Ninja Fit, not such and such as martial arts, because I thought to the time, at the time, the, the American Ninja Warrior thing yeah. was getting blown up five or yeah. six years ago, huge on TV. I'm like, that would be awesome. We have a complex, you know, so we got rock walls over here climbing and, yeah. and you know, the Ninja Obstacle Course over here. And in one corner here, there's a room where they can, if they can learn a Ninja moves and the board breaks and the weapons and all that stuff. And I'm like, it'll be a complex. It'll be yeah. Ninja Fit. And we'll talk about fitness. There'll be a smoothie bar in there. So I had all these cool ideas. And now the axe throwing things getting big. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So I, I thought about doing that as a seminar, as like a one-off seminar. Uh, we had a big open field in, in front of this place where I was training at, uh, teaching at before. And I, I bought $600 worth of the stuff, the throwing axes, stars, knives, throwing darts, even just everything. And, this, and the, the boards to throw them into. And I contacted the insurance company. I'm like, this would probably be smart to ask for help and make sure I'm covered on my bases. But I did that after I ordered all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, we don't want that. We will only insure you if you're in a secure location, like a boxed in place or something. I'm like, that's weird. Yeah, you know, I feel like a, a field out in the middle of nowhere is going to be safer, but whatever so they don't so, they don't have a box they don't have a, something in the drop down for how that's handled right yeah. and so that was a challenge but then i found out there's there's throwing trailers axe throwing trailers and go. stuff like that so i keep thinking that's a, that's a cool little offset of my business at some point in time we just yeah. call it ninja throws or something and, and we we hire it out for you know, weekends Birthday or parties, parties and stuff yeah. like that and teach them how to throw the stars and stuff like that and, and uh, so i don't know i've got all these ideas now that are just booming and all that to, to kind of grow business or different aspects of the business but I got to get this thing solid first and, and help them pay the bills okay. so I can take a break from the day job or back off from it or something and, and explore those and grow those, have the time and the energy to grow those because it's the energy is the other part. You get home at 10 o'clock at night, you wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go work and, and be outside all day during the day. And you I teach understand. classes that night, you get home at 10 and I don't want to do nothing else. I understand. <laughs> People want to find you online, website, social media, where would they go? Uh, Ninja Fit website, I think, has links to most of my social media stuff that's there. Facebook, uh, Jake Meisner. It's a weird last name. It's M-I-E-S-N-E-R. Uh, you can find me there. Just Ninja Fit. You can find Ninja Fit on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those things. Very good. Awesome. Thanks for being here, Jake. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.